this week on Warriors and Company. You cannot look at the Roberts Court and say that they've done anything other than systemically unravel voting rights, women's rights, workers' rights, environmental progress. I think it's hard for anybody looking at this court objectively to come away not thinking that it's a court in pursuit of an agenda. Funding is provided by Ann Gumowitz, encouraging the renewal of democracy. Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. The Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Kohlberg Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. If you had trouble sorting through the blizzard of decisions released by the Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice John Roberts, you've come to the right place. Two of the most knowledgeable court watchers in journalism are here to help decode the implications of those five to four rulings on public prayer, organized labor, campaign finance reform, and the Hobby Lobby case. That's the decision that certain companies on religious grounds do not have to provide health insurance for some forms of birth control. Linda Greenhouse covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times for 30 years and still writes a bi-weekly column for that paper. She's a lecturer as well as the Knight Distinguished Journalist in Residence at the Yale Law School. Dahlia Lithwick, who has a law degree from Stanford, is a senior editor at Slate.com, where she writes the website's Supreme Court Dispatches and Jurisprudence columns. Currently, she's working on a book about the four women who have served as Supreme Court justices. Welcome to you both. Thank you. You have covered the court, Linda, since 1978. In that context, what do you make of the Roberts Court? Ah, so I, I try to think generously about the court, you know, but I think it's hard for anybody looking at this court objectively to come away not thinking that it's a court in pursuit of an agenda. And I'm sorry to say, I think that agenda maps on pretty closely to a Republican Party platform in things that, in the hot button issues that many of us care the most about. And is that unique in the years you've covered the court? I have to say so, yes, in, in terms of, of uh, a five member coalition having coalesced for those results. Uh, not that there haven't been conservative versus liberal uh, splits on the court always. And I covered the transition between the Berger court to the Rehnquist court and certainly Chief Justice Rehnquist had an agenda, it was a kind of a state's rights agenda that he was pretty successful in accomplishing. But what we see now, I think, is a much broader effort across more areas of constitutional doctrine that really touch the, the lives of people, um, whether it's religion, speech, politics, and, and, and so on. So it, it's uh, something that I, I find quite concerning. I agree. I think that you know you need look no farther than the win record of places like the Chamber of Commerce. You know, big business at the court is having its winningest uh, few seasons under the auspices of the John Roberts Court. You know, these are these are you know business interests that used to win you know 50 percent of the time, 60 percent of the time, and in the last few years, between 70 and 80 percent of the time. Uh, issues on which the Chamber of Commerce and other pro-business lobbies get involved in cases, we're looking at huge win rates. And I think if you look at the architecture of unraveling the, the sort of Warren Court revolution, what the court stood for, uh, you cannot look at the Roberts Court and say that they've done anything other than systemically unravel voting rights, women's rights, workers' rights, environmental progress. It's, it's a pretty palpable and, I think, unequivocal trend. I think you've also written that the right on the court 
is further right than mainstream conservatives? Well, I think that there's two things. One is that it's absolutely clear, I think this is empirically proven, that for the last few decades, everybody who retires on the court is replaced by someone either slightly to their right or significantly to their right. So the court has not uh, kept a pace with you know, mainstream legal thought. The court has torqued more and more to the right. And I do think that on some of these issues, notably birth control, uh, which we saw kind of I guess somewhat uh, illuminated in the Hobby Lobby discussion, this is a, a, a view of birth control that is not at all in step, I think, with where the American public is on birth control. And so I think in that sense, the court isn't simply to the right of sort of mainstream legal thought, but dramatically to the right of the rest of the country. So you had uh, Scalia, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas way out there, and you had Chief Justice Roberts, I think, uh, misinterpreted by many people as steering a moderate middle course. What he was doing was, as he's been doing all along, steering a strategic course to tee up the court to ultimately be in a place where he'd like it to be, but he doesn't need it to be there all at once. Where do you think he would like it to be? Well, I think he'd like to get uh, the government out of the business of um, exhibiting special solicitude toward claims of racial discrimination. And they've, they're moving right along on that. Uh, the, the voting rights decision a year ago, Shelby County indicates that, and they didn't quite get what they wanted in the Fisher case last year, the University of Texas affirmative action case, because they couldn't quite bring Justice Kennedy along. But that's certainly you know, part of the agenda. Another part, the court has, is in the process of sort of hijacking the First Amendment free speech principle as a tool of deregulation in a, a startling way. Startling? Startling, yeah. yeah. What would have been not too many years ago considered just ordinary garden variety federal or state regulation of business activity. All of a sudden we see that there's a First Amendment claim uh, being raised by the business interests, of free speech, uh, commercial speech, corporate speech that, uh, you know, is being given a great deal of deference uh, by the court. They keep pushing this notion of the corporation's personhood. How far can they push that before they lose their claim to be rational and reasonable men? I think that for a lot of court watchers, it was simply staggering to take the principle announced in Citizens United that corporations have First Amendment speech rights, which as controversial as it was to the rest of us, was not all that controversial uh, in the First Amendment community, but to extend that to religious freedom under RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, was breathtaking. I mean, that wasn't simply corporate personhood from, from Citizens United tweaked a little bit. That was saying that for purposes of religious freedom, corporations uh, pull into the parking lot next to you at church and put on a hat and pray, and that they can uh, exhibit religious conscience in a way that defies, I think, the, the, the metaphor defies most of us. Most of us cannot say that Hobby Lobby prays or exercises religion in the parlance of the case. Or has a soul. Or has a Which soul. Which many religious people believe comes with the turf. And so I, I think that that was, uh, you know, it's a, a part of the case that a little bit disappeared in the conversation around birth control. But really, I think the part that was breathtaking for those of us watching the court was the ease with which they transported this idea that corporations are people too for speech purposes to the idea that corporations are persons under a statute that was supposed to protect persons. There's nothing in that opinion, the way it's structured, that you can say, aha, here's the stopping point. Instead, you read it and you say, whoa, this just goes on and on. It, it stops at, at Hobby Lobby uh, today because it's, Hobby Lobby brought the case, but it, there's no reason why it wouldn't apply to some other more conventionally organized company too. What do you make of the fact that uh, Justice Alito said, well, this applies only to the contraceptive mandate? Do you take him literally? 
at his word? What worries me about the Hobby Lobby decision, if he's simply going to say contraception is different, and he says that in the opinion, this is different from real medical interests like vaccinations. You know, there, there really is a compelling interest, but contraception is different. So I, I find that in and of itself terrifying. If I have to take him at his word that this is an unserious government interest, then that's extremely problematic for women's reproductive health and freedom and economic freedom in this country. And so it's almost, there's a way in which one has to, to look at, and you know, Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her dissent calls this a minefield, you know, that what he's opening up is a parent Pandora's box. One exemption after another for any claim for religious conscience. And, and, and clearly, if you uh, read the opinion, there is, as Linda says, really no limiting doctrinal principle. He's just asserting for, for purposes of this case, contraception isn't a sufficiently compelling thing, not just to, to protect and privilege, but to even really discuss in the opinion. He just elides over the problem of it. And to me, I think it raises the possi one terrifying possibility, which is that contraception isn't a real medical need, and that scares me. The other is that maybe that this religion is somehow just a real religion, and that the court is inserting itself into the business of deciding when the Jehovah's Witnesses come along and the Scientologists and the, the strict Muslims, that their religious claims are less privileged, that's equally terrifying in my view. He left out a whole bunch of other stuff. For instance, uh, gay rights. Uh, it, it was the, the court's silence on that was rather thunderous. And that's really the next frontier because we, we've seen this even before the Hobby Lobby case where uh, religiously motivated employers will say, uh, you know, I don't approve of, of you know, this quote, lifestyle, uh, so I don't need to hire, I don't need to do business with, I don't need to, uh, you know, bake a cake for a same-sex wedding, I don't need to this, that, and the other thing. And so uh, I found that a very telling silence, both from the Alito majority opinion and the Anthony Kennedy concurring opinion. Of course, Justice Kennedy is being hailed as a hero in many quarters for having written the court's majority opinion uh, last year in the Windsor case that invalidated the Defense of Marriage Act and has been invoked by a couple dozen uh, federal district judges around the country in striking down uh, state provisions that uh, rule out same-sex marriage. Uh, so where was Kennedy on this? Is Justice Alito the most partisan of the justices as you see the court? Oh, there's, there's competition for that title. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, Justice Scalia, much his senior, has distinguished himself for many years uh, in writing uh, dissenting opinions that basically seek to mobilize the base. Okay, I mean, it's very interesting. The, the Republican base. Republican base. The Wall Street Journal had an editorial this week uh, purporting to uh, criticize Justice Ginsburg's dissenting opinion as being overblown and seeking to mobilize the progressive base. Uh, you know, against the against the court's majority, and I thought, haven't they been listening to their friend Nino for the last, <laughs> you know, 30 years? Before you came, I've been leafing through the new book by Lawrence Tribe and Joshua Matz, uh, Uncertain Justice, they call it, reminding us that, quote, justices can frame the way we live. So how is the Roberts Court framing the way we live? Let's take race. Let's take how the Roberts Court right. a year ago, the five members in that majority in Shelby County, the Voting Rights Act case, framed the story of America and race, okay? If you read that opinion, hey, problem solved. Yeah, we had a problem once. We had sort of a serious problem once and Congress dealt with it and lo and behold, the problem's over. Uh, the law that was a powerful tool to deal with racial discrimination in voting is outdated. There's no need for it anymore. Uh, you know, Congress has stubbornly refused to revise it to bring it up to modern reality. And so uh, that part of the law, the formula that, you know, set the whole mechanism of voting rights protection in motion is unconstitutional. So that's a framing device. Uh, and, you know, I, I assume they're sincere in believing it, but I think it's not, it's not the America, uh, the American story that most of us understand it to be. 
And, and, and I would just add to that, I think one of the most powerful dissents written this year comes up in an affirmative action case out of Michigan. And right. this isn't directly an affirmative action case because it's the state attempting to ban affirmative action. So it's the flip of the cases we've looked at. But the court does another recitation of the only way to get beyond race is to get beyond race. And we have to just all acknowledge that racism was a problem, but thankfully it's over. And Justice Sonia Sotomayor writes this unbelievable dissent that draws from her experience growing up in America that has very much not gotten beyond race and more or less says to the court, look at me, look at me and people like me before you say that the way to get beyond race is to get beyond race. The way to get beyond race, she writes, is to talk about it and to acknowledge what it is to be an outsider in this country. And I think uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg does it in Hobby Lobby as well, saying this isn't the America we experience. We as women, we as minorities, uh, we as people seeking uh, justice at the, at the hands of the court system. This isn't the America we see. And so I think there's a real pushback in the dissents in all these cases that it says it may be that you have gotten beyond race, majority of five. The rest of us are still really struggling. So in the Hobby Lobby case, are they framing corporations possessing more rights as persons than people as individuals? Are they reframing our relationship to corporations? I'll give you an oblique answer to that. I think you have to understand Hobby Lobby setting it alongside the other big religion case this term, which is a case called Town of Greece, Town of Greece against Galloway, which upheld the uh, recitation of Christian prayers at the start of town board meetings in this uh, upstate New York town. And this practice was challenged by two non-Christian citizens who didn't feel like having to listen to these prayers when they showed up at the town board to conduct their business. And they argued, and the lower court agreed, that this was an effective establishment of religion in violation of the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. And Justice Kennedy, writing for the five to four majority that overturns the lower court and upholds the prayer, says, yeah, you know, these two plaintiffs were offended, but..." Adults in America hear lots of offensive speech and basically just, uh, you know, deal with it. I mean, a total lack of, you might say, empathy uh, for the position of these plaintiffs who were being made to feel, who claimed they were made, being made to feel excluded as citizens in their community. So uh, take a look at that, and then eight weeks later, we come down with the Hobby Lobby, where the, the court's solicitude for the conscience claim of Hobby Lobby's owners, not from having to hand out birth control to their employees, but simply following a federal law that includes contraception within the employee health plan, and the employees could decide to do whatever they wanted about that, uh, that this, this attenuated claim was so worthy of, of being heard that the court was just dripping with empathy for Hobby Lobby's owners. Do you sense any empathy there for women in the, in the majority? What's interesting to me is, and somebody actually counted the, the words, the number of time the word women appeared in the majority opinion, as opposed to all this language of, of real deep identification with the religious owners. And it, it's clearly uh, disparate. In other words, uh, you know, it's not only that, that women don't show up, but uh, Justice Alito, in his opinion, does this sort of clever thing, which I, I like in, in one of my columns to the way uh, Ricky used to talk to Lucy, where he sort of says, I'm going to grant you that this is important so that I don't have to argue it. Uh, so the, the, Alito sort of says, let's just concede that it's an important issue. But then he never engages with it. He in no place says, my God, there are all sorts of non-procreative reasons, urgent health reasons, basic reasons that have to do with women's ability to control their reproductive lives over you know, 40 years of, of a career, none of that is acknowledged. And so there's a way in which, by simply conceding it, he gets around the fact that he, he doesn't have to talk about it. And it seems to me that this country, you know, if you think about the rhetoric around the Hobby Lobby case and the degree to which this has been represented as sort of loose women who are too lazy to go to the drugstore and buy a condom, and the, the blowback we've had about that, had the court had the conversation that says, here's a reason that 99% of American women use contraception and 
These are all the medically indicated reasons that sometimes a very expensive IUD is the thing that the doctor will recommend for you. None of that happens. And because it doesn't happen in the court, it doesn't happen, I think, in the conversation around the decision. And it seems to me that our ability to have the conversation about why this is just one of the central tragedies of Hobby Lobby. Well, and I think we also have to acknowledge that that this whole contraception discussion in Hobby Lobby is a proxy for abortion, right? So Hobby Lobby's owners say not, not, not all the religious objectors to the contraception mandate are in the same position, but Hobby Lobby's owners say the only things we object to are the, quote, abortifacients among the 20 or so uh, required contraceptions by the, by the mandate. Uh, and of course, that's a total, uh, it, it's, a, it's a total falsehood, actually, because uh, if you take the medical definition of pregnancy, I mean, what does abortion do? It ends, a, ends an ongoing pregnancy. None of these contraceptions, the contraceptives actually do that. They, none of them that are on that list work after the fertilized egg has implanted right. in the uterus. And so if somebody wants to believe that a fertilized egg has full personhood, that's certainly their privilege. But that's not a medical definition of pregnancy. So the, the sort of hijacking of this issue and importing it into the abortion issue is a very uh, clever move that's really at the center, even if unacknowledged at, on, in, in this whole debate. And I would just add, I, I think, you know, Linda, Linda said, you know, we have to look at Hobby Lobby next to Town of Greece, the legislative prayer case. I think we also have to a little bit look uh, at it next to McCullen, with the abortion buffer case. Because well, they, while that... That case d removed any buffer between the protesters outside who, in some cases, were harassing the women going into the clinic, and, and now they can go right up to the door. Right. I mean, there was a 35-foot buffer. This is Massachusetts. It comes up after a history of horrific clinic violence, including shootings at clinics. And Massachusetts says, we don't know how to keep these women safe and how to keep public safety and health uh, beyond this 35-foot buffer. And it comes up as a free speech case. But in the opinion read it, written by Chief Justice John Roberts, the solicitude for these uh, uh, sidewalk counselors and the implication that everyone who has ever stood outside a clinic to talk to a woman does so in gentle tones, uh, with sweetness and light, and without any acknowledgement that there is a reason, a historic reason, that these women needed to be protected on their way into the um, clinics is really another uh, example of, of what Linda's describing is that over-empathizing with one set of interests and almost total uh, uh, disregard for the interests of those women seeking abortions. And I just think, uh, I, I track both of these as going back to, you know, John, uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy uh, in the last time the court heard a major uh, abortion case was so careful to say, we're just worried women are extra frail and sometimes they regret their abortions and we have to be super duper careful with getting them good information. And it seems to me that that's kind of the pill from which so much of this sentiment that all of First Amendment law stops and all of religious freedom stops. And everything in the, the, the constitutional architecture of this country stops when we're talking about women and their reproductive systems. It's right. so strange. You are both reporters and well-respected. But as women, can you be objective uh, about five religiously conservative men making it harder for women to get help with birth control? I'm not trying to be objective. I'm trying to understand where they're coming from and explain it to people. But, uh, you know, these days I'm paid by the New York Times to be an opinion columnist and, and <laughs> I like to back up my opinion with facts. So where do you think they are coming from? I think they're coming from a, you know, a narrow worldview. I mean, you know, let's be impolite and point out that all well, five of them are, are Roman Catholic uh, and, and uh, in service of uh, an agenda by a couple of presidents who were elected on a party, Republican Party platform that called, called for picking judges who would overturn Roe against Wade. And, you know, being Catholic is a fair proxy for that in the minds of judge pickers. I, I think that wildly overstates the, uh, you know, the, the case for the great majority of American Catholic women. I'm not saying that. 
so you have these five guys who have a rather uh, narrow background, uh, who live in a certain bubble, and uh, you know I think are projecting their perspective onto the face of constitutional law. We'll continue this discussion online. Linda Greenhouse, Dahlia Lithwick, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you for having us. Thank you, it was great. At our website, BillMoyers.com, you can see my complete conversation with Dahlia Lithwick and Linda Greenhouse, and we'll connect you to their most recent reporting on the Supreme Court. That's at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. Funding is provided by Ann Gumowitz, encouraging the renewal of democracy. Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. The Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Kohlberg Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.